your programmers. Oh, shame. Actually, because the problem is, like, my audience, they're my golden audience, the people I really want to talk to, people I want to actually have some kind of impact on are not programmers. But, but maybe you can help me out, right? So, um, because how do you go to parties? Have you been to parties recently? I, I, I mean, I've got three kids, so I haven't been for a while. But when I did go to parties, you, mean, you meet people, hi, how's it going? What's your name? Sam? So I'm having a conversation. This is quite unusual for me, normally. I'm programming all day. Um, and they ask me, oh, what do you do? And I say, I'm a programmer. Silence. I mean, they must have had that experience. And then they just walk away. And let's do a programming party, then that's fine. But normal parties, people don't normally tend to talk about programming. And I don't know about you, but I find that deeply frustrating. Because there's so much beauty, there's so much joy in programming to share with everybody that the inability to even start talking about it to people who don't have a, a direct experience with it is really frustrating. I find it deeply frustrating. So now, I lie. So if I go to a party now, people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a musician. I say, oh great, what do you play? And now I've got them. They <laughs> cope. <laughs> and like, the, the least we're having a conversation this morning. And uh, so what, what I'm trying to do, hopefully, is to give you maybe a tool that you can use to help have that conversation with other people. But actually, the real problem isn't, isn't you guys and your party experience. I think the real problem is how do we engage everybody else? And not just people our age, but people older and, ideally, much younger. Um, and so I think that if we say to people, and then people say, well, why do we need a program? I mean, why do we need a program? That's a really good question. I mean, in the UK, we've just started to introduce computer science in schools, and that's fabulous. But when people talk about why they need a program, the, the same, same standard things come up, because you can get a job. And I don't know, most of you, probably all of you here have jobs because you can program, but you're all probably, like me, quite weird, right? You probably discovered programming for its own beauty, for its own joy, and you spent time in your own time just learning about these things, right? So you're all quite weird people. And I think that the things that we, that got us started by programming, aren't necessarily the same things that we should use to excite other people. And also, the, our motivations aren't the same motivations that probably other people might have to start programming. So I think we need to, to, to look beyond our own cultures and look beyond our own small programming communities to think about how do we engage everybody else. And so um, when we talk about uh, uh, engagement and we talk about using having, having a job to, to, to learn the program, I think that's, that's a bad start. How many people learn sports at school to become professional sports people? Some people, but not all. Should we only teach sports to the people who are going to be the professional sports people? Of course not. Like, there's so many beautiful and positive things to get from, from studying sports that are beyond just getting a job. And I think the same as programming is true. And just to think about an analogy to this, I mean, how many people uh, think that reading and writing is only for business? Right? Do we do reading and writing for other things than, than making rich people richer? Yes, of course we do, right? Um, and this is, the other, this is the other point as well. I, I never talk to programmers. I really say you've got unbelievably great skills, all of you. Um, why are you using it? Not all, I'm not saying all of you do, but many programmers use it to make rich people richer. That just makes me a bit sad. And I think there are more things we can do. And I think that engaging broader audiences, especially young people, uh, showing people that the code is much more than writing uh, business applications or business websites, I think that's a really a good way to start. So, I mean, maybe you completely disagree with me, it's fine, right? And uh, you can uh, come and talk to me afterwards and tell me why you disagree with me, it'd be very interesting to hear. Uh, but if you do agree, then maybe we need to start having a conversation about what other things can you do with code? Where are they? What other domains can you use? And so, uh, and, and ideally, why are we learning code? if it's not making jobs. And my thing is, I think that code is an amazing new tool that humans can use to express themselves. Just like we use the, the, the technology of language, voice, to express themselves, computing code is also a technology that also is an amazingly powerful expressional tool. We just haven't really learned how to use it as such yet. It's so nascent, so young. Like if you, if you start, who's watched the Structure and Interpretations of Computer Programs lectures? Right. All of you need to go and watch those things. They're unbelievably cool. Um, from the 80s, Sussman and Johnson, and they talk about uh, uh, scheme. But they, they open it up by talking about programming being extremely new. And they talk about uh, in other sort of technologies, other fields of study. Um, and they come and they gamble with geography. It says geography came around uh, from the Egyptian periods where they were looking at the Nile and they were worried about where the flooding might be. So they, they created tools and compasses 
maps to actually figure out where, the, where it was safe to, to, to plot the lands. Do we call geography compassing? Never. Do we call astronomy telescoping? So why do we call computing computing? Because obviously we're still very, very young. So we, we haven't figured out what we can do with it. I think there's lots more stuff. And I think music is one of the many things you can do with computing that's really interesting, expressive, and let's go back to what I was saying earlier, it's something that we can use to engage a broader audience, people who aren't programmers already. And I think that this, this is where it, gets, where it gets really exciting. So, this is what I've created, this thing called Sonic Pi. Um, it's a Ruby DSL, a bit like Rails, but it doesn't make websites, it makes sounds. Um, and uh, in the same kind of way that Rails was trying to make all of the sort of hard, uh, uh, complicated enterprise tech stacks a bit more simple and engaging and easy to start with, this has exactly the same properties. And I developed this in schools with school kids. And uh, I don't know if anyone's been to schools recently, but it's, uh, it's a different experience. You know, like uh, the teachers just trying, basically spending most of the time trying to get the kids to listen. Right? And they've got all these technologies of techniques to use, like clapping their hands or counting down or pointing fingers and waggling. And whatever technique they're using, at some point, hopefully, the children are sitting there listening. And they, the teachers have no time, no time to talk to the school children. So if you think about it, they've got time for maybe two or three sentences before the kids are minds are wandering. What are your two or three sentences to engage kids in programming? If you were in that school, is it opening maps? <laughs> <laughs> I would like that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, even then, it's like, is it create a, work, a project or a workspace or a file system uh, entity? And all these things that take, take many lessons to understand. So you need to find ways to actually to get them straight away. So this is why. Sonic Pi is also a text editor. I built my own text editor to make this experience much easier. It's also an app. So you just download it from Mac, you download it from PC if you have a Raspberry Pi, or it's called Sonic Pi. It's also installed by default. Um, so you just open the application and you get this kind of environment and you can just type text and you can run and you get errors. Great. So this is my first program. It's a red deck. Um, and so undefined local variable method, blah, 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 fine. So what, are, what can we call? Well, I've got the sort of auto-completion thing going on, so I call play, give it a number, and I can hear a sound. Can we turn it up a little? Is it possible to turn that up? Brilliant, there we are. At this point, I can spend hours, so I've only got about 20 minutes left, so I'm going to go stupidly quickly. Um, but at this point, there's loads of opportunities for learning to talk about abstractions, but numbers have this property that they go up and go down, which is great. What else in the world goes up and goes down? And can we therefore use numbers to model those things? Clearly, pitch the music goes up. So if I do something like this, I get a higher note. And if I do something like this, I get a low note. I can also do something like this and get notes in between notes. So I'm free to, to choose whatever note I want. Um, and at this point, kids do this kind of thing. What about this? Can they play this note? If you're a bat, maybe you could hear that. <laughs> um, and then this one. This is a really fun. Like, yeah, this. So I did this talk to uh, 2,000 Java developers. Netherlands about three weeks ago, and it was in a cinema. And I did this line of code, thinking maybe you might hear a little bit, and the face just pumped. And the people are sick for it. It was amazing. So you can tell, like, the one line of code, you can get people in, in, engaged, interested. So this, you can play any note at this point. Oh, yeah, you can hear that. Look, just the back, right? So this is cinema. You'd be, you'd be yeah, scared. Um, so there we are. This is, how you, this is the first program in Sonic Pi. You don't have to think about objects and classes and any of that stuff. You just write into the function, give it a parameter, press the run button or hit the shortcuts, and you get immediate output. And you can even visualize what's going on in the scope of the object. And then, uh, at this point, you think, well, okay, I want to make a melody. So that's 60 then, uh, 65, say. And uh, I don't know what, what your expectations are, they're probably not, probably not the same as what actually happens. Because this is where it sort of deviates from traditional programming languages. Although it's a Ruby DSL, there's lots of weirdness going on. It's not quite Ruby, it's mostly Ruby. Um, here, uh, you might, you might, one way to think about it is the computer's crazy fast. So it plays note 60 and then note 65 pretty much at the same time, but one after the other. But actually, I've got this insane sort of clock system underneath. And this plays both these notes sample accurately at the same time. So one, 44,100 in a second in terms of accuracy. Um, because you need this, and I'll get into this in a moment, when you actually move on from doing beeps and bleeps like this to performing on stage at, at musical venues. Like you, when you're doing music, you care about time, you care about sound. And so 
it, one of the challenges of Sonic Pi was not just to make something that I can go in the classroom and do this kind of thing, but also the same tool I could go on stage and perform. And I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but that's what a guitar is, right? You go to school, you pick up a guitar, you start learning, but then there are an amazing guitarist professionally using the same instruments. So could we imagine Sonic Pi as a sort of utopian guitar where people can to both take, both learn, pick it up very simply, but also take it to a crazy level? So, we want to make a melody, we need one more command. And we have our melody, look at that. Now, I, I don't know about you, but that excites me to uh, believe the um, <laughs> But think about it, right? Uh, what is Western music? It's mostly which note to play, when to play it. But I have the ability to make any melody with these two commands. Any bass line, any riff, any Mozart, any Daft Punk. With these two commands, I can do that, but more importantly, you can do and even more importantly, your children do things, and they do. It's so fun to watch. And so this is the thing, right? So at this point, I basically, uh, I was trying to use the computer science curriculum. I've done this. You can obviously then use your standard favorite Ruby things, so I can like, use the iteration. A bit of repetition going on. You can do a bit of function calling, so you can make abstractions, kind of first part, second part, you can do randomization, and then we go into detail about that. If you want to spend time talking to me, I've spent a lot of time randomization stuff. It's not the standard room of randomization. Um, but the question then is, where, where do you go from here? And I think this is the exciting thing as programmers. We have this starting point, which is making some sort of basic things. But if I want to go on stage and promote that, where, how do I take this? And this is where it gets really interesting. So first of all, you, what you can do is you can change the sound, so that thing is a bit, a bit uh, boring. So I can use synth. There's a bunch of built-in synths. So let's start choose the chip lead, or like the piano. So you can obviously change these things, and it's uh, effects go below it, so I can switch between that and I can saw wave below. So you can modify the sounds. Now these synthesizers, this huge synth piano, is a uh, as documentation about it, and it has all those, those black things that you can't read at this all. They're all the different options, the different things you can change. Each of the synthesizers has up to sort of 20 or 30 different controls. So the timbre of the sound is fully programmable. And this is where you can start spending serious time exploring the sound, figuring out what, what crazy things you can do with each of the synthesizers. And that, this is to me where it gets really exciting. Um, but what do I mean by this? Well, let's, let's have a look at this. If I have a use synth profit, and you play, and I used to also can use group symbols to represent notes. Um, and I let's go for at least time of eight seconds. Exactly, right? But you can pass these options. There's a bunch of these options. I can change the low pass filter. Oh no, no, that's actually pretty so. Here I have less uh, cr crunchy. So you can start to mess around these things. I didn't notice that the, the sounds are laying on top of each other. So every time you press the run button, it creates a new thread. It's one, two, three. And the old thread is still running, the sound is still being produced, but you're just throwing more sounds on top. So already we're dealing with a concurrent system, um, which is rather fun. And, and why do we need that? Well, I, I can explain in a moment. So, but uh, before I do that, I'll say what else. So you can play different notes, you can wait time to different notes, you can change the sounds, you can modify the sounds, and there's many modifications to make. I really encourage you to download this and just explore and play. Um, but you can also play samples. So this is like the Armen break, which is the most famous drum break, um, which is formed like a hip hop and drum and bass, gather, and, you know, jungle. Oh, what do I mean by that? So like NWA used the same sample, and they just played out a half speed, cracked on top. And then you've obviously got the, the standard drum and bass sound. Yeah. And then the jungle, which is the same thing, but faster, right? So you can take the same sample and you can change its rates, right? And this, this is a lot of fun. You can even do this, right? What do you think this is going to do? Oh, that's not that. This. Backwards. So you can play it backwards at half speed, forwards, whatever. So you can play around it. You like that? That's great. That's good. So, yeah, if you like that, you're going to love it. There's, there's, there's so much more you can do that I've got 30 minutes to explain to you. Um, and I guess the way I can uh, explain that is that tonight, 
He's come to the, the DigitalOcean party, and I'll be performing. So you'll be able to see like, where you can take it, right? Um, but let's look at other things. So uh, before I continue, uh, it's really important just to make sure that you understand this is free, it's open source, you can download it on all your operating systems. And if you press the help button um, here, well, that's the information button. Oh, yeah. Here. There's a full tutorial, and this is a full book. There's like 40 pounds and it's written assuming you know nothing about programming and nothing about music. So if you know little about that either, you can whip through it. If you don't, you can still whip through it. Um, and children have taught themselves how to code using this tutorial. Adults have taught themselves how to code using this tutorial. So you can totally get it in your office. Um, I spent a lot of time documenting every single part of the office. Building something which is useful is one thing, right? That's a beautiful thing. But people build these things, right? I love it. But if it's not something I can immediately just download and use, there's lots of obstacles. And maybe then, if you're a programmer, it's okay to download the bundle of things, the gen things, the part of the things, and put them in this directory, and then you run this rake script, and generate this thing, and then you put this file. So if you're a programmer, you can follow a tutorial that does that, and within half an hour, build the things you build. But if you're my, son, my daughter, my son, you're not going to do that. If you're a computer science teacher, you're not going to do that either all the time. So you just have to work immediately. Um, and also have to have really good documentation. So when it doesn't work as you expect, you can go and figure out why. So it's important to point out is it's really well documented. Uh, and my promise to you, and it's a real promise, is if any part of the documentation doesn't make sense, that's my fault, not your fault. Right? No one's too stupid to code. No one's too stupid to code. It's me, I'm too stupid to actually explain this in a simple way. So if, if you read the tutorial and it doesn't make sense, that's the book. Please tell me, and I'll really do my best to fix it so the next person won't have to fix it. So that's, again, that's a good promise. Uh, but where have you taken it? So I've got samples, I've got synths. The next thing is, you might want to write like a, a, a how to track or something, right? So I quite like a, a sample, bass drum, that's one of these things, it's a, a bass drum. Let's speak for half a second. Right. And we've got the bass drum, right? it's great. So the kids do this. And within a couple of hours, children are doing this. And so let's just comment this out, and then uh, let's create another one of the things. And instead of doing this, let's see for a second, and let's just call one of the other bass. There we are. So, you know, this, this is awesome. Now we're going to play them both at the same time. Now, obviously, you're all programmers, I'm sure you need to see what's going on here. Um, uh, but most people don't realize this. And kids, they want this. Right? They write this code. Within um, uh, four lessons, uh, a number of children are doing exactly this and saying, Excuse me, why can't I get both things at the same time? And uh, this is a bit depressing because in the UK, the answer is you can't do it. Because you have to wait until you the university. <laughs> <laughs> Because you need this thing called concurrency and friends, and we don't teach that in school. I'm sorry. Um, seriously, and then you don't go to a teacher and say, the kids want to do this. And the teacher says, it's not on the syllabus, I haven't got time, I, we can't mark it, it's just not acceptable, we can't teach it. And so this is where you sort of pull the hair out and think this is depressing. How do I fix this? And, and this is the beautiful thing about programming, so programming in general, is that we don't have to stop at this. Loops, they're really crap. They're rubbish. They're like black holes of programs. Unless you're writing something which is sitting on a network socket, just Nginx or something, just, just waiting for new HTTP requests. Then, yeah, you just, that's all it's ever going to do, do the same thing. Or a computer like a game or something. But if you ever want it to do two things at the same time, or if you want to change the behavior, loops just don't give you anything at all that's useful. Um, so, as programmers, what do you do? You invent new things. So, I'm afraid this is a live loop. So you just add live loop, right? code and it gives you an error. Um, because live loop needs to have a unique name. These are now no longer uh, loops. These are people. These are performers. This is my band. And uh, I've got Sarah playing the drums, Freddie playing the bass. And then when I run the code, off we go. So now we've got Sarah and Freddie, so we've got the current. Well, there's one more thing, right? Um, I think I've got eight minutes left, so I'm being stupid quickly. Uh, at this point, 
people are really quite happy now. They've got their things at the same time. But if I if I played that for more than a minute, it all leave. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be something work. So what I really want to be able to do is, I mean, this is the standard programming thing, right? So you have an idea, we're going to build. Um, we don't do the TV thing, we just write the code first. We write the code first, <laughs> seriously. Um, unless we know exactly what it is going to build, then we do the TV thing. Um, unless we can get to book, which is kind of sort of right to test the other framework, we use the same thing to test itself. But other than that, I'm not sure what the value of these things are. But here we write the code. Um, we then run the tests, in this case, we listen to the music. And then, so, okay, so, think, okay, I want to change the bass drum to sound a bit less crispy. So, sorry, I want to stop dancing. I'm going to change the code. So, let's go to 70. Okay, there we are, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to change the code. Half speed. But that's not going to work, it's performance. As programmers, that's totally normal, right? Like you always tear down the code again, run the test, tear it down again, do this until it works, right? But when you're performing, what you really want to be able to do is just change the code and have it just automatically in the barrel. So this live loop thing doesn't just give you concurrency, it gives you the ability to change the code. Yeah, left. This is already like a lot of fun, just enough. I can give you enough stuff to go away and have some fun. But I, I want to just go in and show you more stuff I've done. So uh, <laughs> this is an example of square function. It's a cool uh, UK uh, artist, such uh, an And he did a lot of stuff for that arm end frame thing we saw, right? Uh, so let's just go back to look at that. Uh, and if we Let's change time. Let's change the speed of time so we just use a BPM, use some BPM. Because this half second is not half second on live. It's actually half a beat. And uh, time is like a thread local variable, so each of my live loops can have their own motion time, their own motion BPM. So you do crazy polarific stuff. You also stretch time based on the length of samples. Again, don't listen to what I'm saying, it's just, just crazy science. But uh, the effect here is that I can now basically uh, see the one length now, yeah. which is fun. But what, what, um, what Square Push did is he basically took that sample file as a WAV file, looked for all the transits, all the drum that were fixed for it, and then carefully using the scissors in this the audio app, took them out, and then copy and pasted them from time to time, and spent days, different weeks. Um, could we do this in a slightly better way? So, what we could actually do is just sleep for a short amount of time to get rid of this, and then just use this onset command. Uh, which is just an option to the sample option. And here, I'm just putting out that first drum board, right? And I can now work through this. Or I can use this. Now we're off. So it's random infantry and drum boards. I mix it into just like a whole star, whole genre of music in four lines of code. <laughs> um, so that, that's a little fun. You can do that with any sample. So you can, I can take the, the uh, guitar sample, do the same thing. Guitar, uh, this one, 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 this and this is where it really combines with things like the randomization system. So something why it's fully deterministic is best stuff to make it. So all the randomization stuff is deterministic. Uh, so if I were to do the cuts and rounds, print the value is 1.75006. I call it again, it's the same value. Um, and if I uh, if I do this twice, obviously I'm going to get two different values. But get this. If you do this with your round back. Uh, I can undo randomization, uh, which actually turned out to be really useful when you make music. It's now a tool I've been working with. Uh, what would I do with this? So uh, if I did that, the live loop stuff, and I've got this What I can do is like, do eight times, do, 
with random seed. So we've done well. And we've got repetition. So we can start building melodies by changing this number that's what you have. Show you one more thing. So, um, you, if you have a guitar and you have an audio pedal, uh, sorry, audio card in your system, you can just use this new command, which is on the back here, and you call it the full, and you run the code, and it will pull the audio in from your guitar. You now get the guitar, right? I didn't show you this, but you could also do uh, this thing where you say, with effects, reverb, or uh, whatever, and wrap that around, and now you've got a guitar with reverb. And you add another one. Distortion, say, and now you've got guitar passive distortion, passive reverb. So you can build up these change effect properties. Um, I can show you very quickly, but 30 seconds left, it's ridiculously short of time. But um, there's one more thing you can do as well, which is MIDI. So I can call MIDI E1, and you can't see that on my MIDI device here, which is hidden away from me, which is a little mode of MIDI. It just flashed, which is pretty cool. Um, but that's no use for you. So what you really want to do is you've got to hear it play. So if I break one of these live ones, Put this in here and sleep for a short amount of time. And I'm going to flash it a lot. But if I then say live audio, no. you can now hear this. Change the amplitude. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm using Ruby to trigger my external synthesizer, super active at the time, which is this Erlang Judge uh, It's then sitting really much to the device, the device then plugged into my audio card, and then with the live audio, bring it back into the pipe, which then I can then use to manipulate the code. That all sounds complicated, but it's five lines of code. If I have some reverb here, actually, let's just use Crush because you can hear that. Take the Crush away. Do you something different to apply? And then you can use uh, rings here, like E1, E2, E3, and two different modes. And then, for the final thing, I can create a little high boot, and I can see what it is in time, with an existing running rate. So, this is the current system, and one thing is at the same time, right? So, if I see what I just do, the sample of bass drum has finished off by adding a kick in. So, this is a little bit five seconds in the cloud. Oh, 